A little bit of extra stuff, Maxwell. Not the coffee house. Okay, so we're talking about Maxwell distributions here. Um, if you're you know, watching this video as an AP Physics 2 student, um, uh, you're not going to need this for the AP Physics 2 class. Uh, if you wanted to jump ahead, you could. But this is something that pops up a lot in the world of the sciences. So I thought, hey, we're here. Why not cover it? Um, in a statistics course, you would learn about something known as a normal curve, where if here is some uh, graph, uh, you would have a curve, and if it was normal, it'd be symmetric around this center line, and it'd be better drawn, but it's difficult to do that on this. Better drawn, better drawn. There we go, good enough. And one of the interesting things about this normal curve, often called a bell curve as well, or this Gaussian distribution, is that we often normalize them. We normalize them such that the area underneath the curve, this area would be equal to 1 if it was normalized. You could have a system that's non-normalized, and that's totally fine. If you had a non-normalized non system, what you'd be looking at is the number of instances uh, of something occurring on that distribution. So oftentimes in intro stats courses, you'll open up a bag of M&Ms, and you'll say, how many of these are blue? How many of these are brown? How many of these are red? How many of these are green? Yeah, whatever colors exist in the M&M &M world, right? Um, uh, and you'd make a distribution about that. For this, maybe this distribution is, uh, a common one is IQ scores. Um, technically, the average or the center line of the IQ scores is 100. If your IQ is greater than 100, you're greater than the average. If it's less than that, you are less than the average. Um, now, interesting thing about IQ scores is while 100 is the average, uh, if you took the average IQ of a person today in the year 2021 and compared it to the average IQ back of someone in the 1800s, our average of uh, intelligence level was probably higher, but because you were scoring at that time period, the average within that period would still be 100. What might be variant a little bit more is this variance or standard deviations. Generally speaking, a standard deviation can be positive or negative. You could be above or below this average or this mean position. And due to King's rule, when we look at standard deviations, this first bit of area here would be something about 0.66. A little more, a little less. I can't exactly remember that number. Uh, it's around two-thirds, though. But it represents 66% of the population in that area. So maybe uh, our intelligences on average are higher, but our standard, but our uh, average IQ is still 100. But maybe our standard deviations have shrunk down a little bit because we're sending everybody to school and everybody is learning. Um, uh, versus some scenarios where only half the population went to school or whatever, okay? So that is what we have here. As you go up in standard deviations, uh, you get further. So like, you know, plus two standard deviations, three, four, whatever, uh, negative two, three, four, whatever. And in general, um, after the second standard deviation, you're at about 95%. And after the third standard deviation, you're somewhere around 97, 98%, or is it 99? It's like 99.7, that's what it is, 99.7. There's a seven that came in there somewhere, I think. This is just King's rule. It's not super precise. The thing to really recommend is two thirds in the beginning for the first standard deviation. And then from there, you're pretty much at 95 and above. Okay? So this is a normalized distribution. Now, why are we talking about this in a thermodynamics lecture? Well, when we looked at the kinetic molecular theory derivation, one of the things we talked about was we had a large number of molecules all moving at random directions and random speeds. And that random speeds part is important to us because uh, depending on the probability of those speeds, we can start determining average velocities based off of temperatures in a system. If you're calling that kinetic molecular theory equation, that RMS speed was dependent on the number three, a constant, the Boltzmann constant, a temperature, and then the mass. Since the mass is what it is for whatever ideal gas you have, that RMS speed is highly dependent on the temperature.
So if we had some sort of function that we could use as a distribution or a distribution function, that would allow us to get a good idea of how many particles are moving fast, how many are moving slow, and how many are kind of in the middle. So we can actually create a distribution function for this. Um, uh, in general, one of the distribution functions we can get, and this is also known as a probability function. So this P here isn't pressure, it is uh, uh, not power, it's a probability of finding a molecule with some uh, velocity here. We could say this is equal, and in the case of a distribution function for a gas, this is a little weird, it'd be equal to four pi times the quantity m over two pi rt to the three halves power times the velocity squared times e to the negative mv squared over two rt. Because that's not a mouthful. Really, it doesn't really matter what this is creating here. What matters is that this is some quantity here, A, some constants that are thrown in there with possibly a velocity term, times e to the minus some 1 over v over kt term. Because R is equivalent to K, you know, moles versus molecules, it doesn't really matter. So when we think about these kind of distribution functions, what we can do with them is we can figure out how many molecules, or even what percentage of the molecules, if it's normalized, are moving at a certain speed, or within some speed range, or within some sort of boundary. Because we're just thinking about areas. And if we're thinking about areas, that means we're thinking about integrating. If we integrate this function between an upper bound and some lower bound, that would give us some amount of area, which would correspond for a normalized curve of what percentage of the particles are moving within that boundary range. So, for instance, if you wanted to find just how many particles exist, have a velocity between zero and infinity, what do you think that would be? It'll be April. If we take a look at what is the probability for some speed to be between zero and infinity, well, the particle's either not moving or it's moving. That would be one. That is the entire function. If we took a look at the area under this curve, where we're going from zero to infinity and we're looking at speeds, this probability function would probably, uh, get it, would probably look something uh, like this, where it has a peak higher in the beginning and then it kind of tails off to the end. This is a skewed distribution because it's probably more likely that particles are going to be here at some uh, velocity rather than out at something near the speed of light. And it technically can't go out to infinity because, you know, this would end at the speed of light here. But generally, mathematically speaking, we call this infinity. But if you wanted to bound this not from zero to infinity, you could. You could find the fraction of that curve by saying, look, let's bind this from some initial velocity v1, some final velocity v2, and then find what this integral would be. And this integral would be dv. This would give you the fractional percentage, or the fractional amount that you could just turn into a percent, of what quantity of that normalized function is within that boundary. So maybe you run this and you get something like 28%, or 0.28. However, this just gives you the fraction. It just gives you the number that are moving at some speed. If you actually wanted to figure out what is 
a average velocity in general of all of the gas particles moving around, you could integrate it from zero to infinity of V multiplied by that distribution function. In doing this, you would actually find this average velocity here. We refer to this as an expectation value. And sometimes you'll see them put in kind of bracketed like that. Sometimes you won't. It depends what kind of physics or math that you're doing. But this is the expected value or an expectation value. If you wanted to find out some average velocity squared, which then you could use for an RMS, you would just integrate this from zero to infinity, not a V, but a V squared multiplied by that distribution function or that density function. And if you wanted cubed, then you could just change this to a cube. Cubes become cubes, okay? So this is something that well, we're not using in this year and in this class. It is an interesting concept. It is something that pops up a lot uh, within the world of science um, that you might have to use. A quick little tip, oftentimes when you need to take this integral, you should do it by parts. And the reason why you're probably gonna have to do it by parts is you're probably gonna have some V to some exponent, like a square or a cube or something. But then this distribution function was recall e to the something. And anytime we see that integral, we're thinking by parts. We're thinking to do this as uv minus the integral of v du. Or if you like to do it tabular method, have at it. But normally you're thinking about that by parts. So if you are in a higher level calculus course and you're starting to see integration by parts, note that it's not just some useless thing that has popped up. We use it all the time in the world of science. Um, and it is for a lot of these distribution functions, uh, which are highly, highly useful. But that is not a tale for today. That is a tale for years to come. And until you hit those points for these kind of Maxwell distributions and distribution functions, we are finished. Adios and take it easy.